you are going to love today. We have a very special superstar artist, Thomas Schaller, one of the top watercolor artists in the world. Welcome, Thomas. Welcome to everybody. Thank you, Eric. Really happy to see you. And uh, I'm very honored that uh, you included me in your series. So very happy to be here. Uh, are you kidding? I mean, you're you're a must, an absolute yeah. must. Thanks. Well, uh so uh, for the for the folks who who may or may not know, because we've got people watching from all over the world, uh, Thomas Schaller is worldwide world world renowned, uh, probably one of the three four best watercolorists in the entire world, and uh, probably the best in the United States living in the United mm. States. So that's you. You've worked hard to accomplish that. Well, I worked hard. That's true. But a lot of people work really hard, and. Uh... You know, as I like to say, there's no one right way to do watercolor or probably anything else. So it's, uh, uh, I'm very honored to be part of a large community of very accomplished watercolorists. And I think uh, that's good enough for me. You know, uh, I, while, while we're on, I have not really, we haven't talked about this yet. But uh, we are going to be doing something very special in January. I think you know what I'm talking about. I do. Uh, uh, we are going to be doing an event called Watercolor Live. It is going yeah. to be a virtual watercolor conference, and you're going to be part of it. I am. Yes. That's, Can't wait. That's pretty exciting. Uh, you know, we, uh, there are lots of, uh, lots of watercolor events where people will get together regionally, you know, there's lots of regional clubs and so on. Uh, this will be a worldwide conference, so uh, watercolors from all over the world, and we're pretty excited. And thank you for being part of that. No, I'm thrilled. It's uh, uh, well, I'm just thrilled that I've I've had the opportunity to travel most of the world, and just um, it's such an amazing community of artists worldwide sharing ideas. And uh, when our travel all got restricted i'm not alone in this you know i felt very sad you know nothing's yeah. going to stop me from painting but events like this remind us all that uh, we're all in this together we can all pull together and still have a communion one to the other so i'm very Absolutely. Glad. thrilled well to right it. before this whole coronavirus thing i i uh so i returned from russia the week before yeah. we went into quarantine and I was due the next week to get on an airplane and go to China. And I know you've, you've participated, uh, but I was going to be going to two plein air events in China. And my understanding is that the, the Chinese plein air movement is all about watercolor. And Lar largely, yes. Yes. And so I was very excited about that. And, and unfortunately, I was going to speak in, I think in seven cities and at two or four universities and, and it all got canceled. So I, I, I can't wait till I can go back. Yeah. Same here. Uh, the last couple of years I've been in China quite a bit and, uh, man, it's, it's humbling to be honest, to, to see the work even students are doing that, that put me to shame, but uh, really? it all helps to, uh, up your game. But, yeah. uh, yeah, they, 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 they know what they're doing. So that's well, we're, hopefully we'll get hopefully we'll get a lot of the folks from China to join us on Watercolor Live. Uh, we'll have to we'll have to figure out how to spread the word to them. So, Thomas, so. what what are you going to do for us today? Well, when I was still allowed to travel earlier this year, yeah, I I spent a great week in um, a little place called Austin, Texas. Yeah, <laughs> actually, for everybody out there, I I did a, my new video DVD video. Um, which I've done a number of videos over the years. This was by far the best experience. Um, I Why do you with, say that? Uh, the, the group at Streamline was just so phenomenal to work with. Easy, but highly professional. And, um, and I also, post-production, you guys have been amazing at promoting it and uh, distributing it. And the production of it is just uh, Top notch. I think uh, it makes me look good. Thank anyway, you. thank you. But I got to stay at Eric's place and stay in the world famous artist cabin behind his uh, beautiful house there. So I've always wanted to do a, a painting of it. So that's what I plan to do today. I did a little really? tiny, 
yeah, I did a little pencil sketch when I was there, but I was a little busy, so didn't get to paint it. So I thought, well, I'll do this for Eric live, live oh, on camera. And if you like it, <laughs> you can have it. If not, you know. No, 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 I would love it. I would love it. Are you kidding? <laughs> no, anyway. So that's, well, that's what I'm doing. So you're going to do a painting demo today. I'm going to do a painting demo, but also, as I always do, as a springboard to talk about why I paint, how I paint, of course, but why I paint, how you choose a subject, how do you interpret what you see and make that into a different kind of reality, what you present on a on a canvas or a piece of paper. So that's what I'm I'll be doing. Outstanding. Okay, so I'm going to let you drop off to set up your camera, and I will see you in a minute. All right. I'll be here. All right. Well, this is an exciting day to have Thomas Schaller on. Oh, man. It, you know, I was, uh, I was saying yesterday, I, I, somebody put a comment in the comment section about, you know, Eric loves his job. I, I really do. I love, I love what I do. I mean, to think about, I, I always have idolized artists and, and wanted to become an artist my whole life and finally did. And, and for me to spend my days like this, talking to you guys and, and, and talking to artists and, and, and uh, getting to see them paint. I mean, any day uh, with it, for me, a day without art is a day without oxygen. And so I hope I'm bringing that to you. So today is day number 171 live. My name is Eric Rhodes. I'm the publisher of Fine Arts Connoisseur and Plen Air magazines, both which are published worldwide, but mostly in the United States. And uh, we do all kinds of things. I, you know, I, I repeat myself a lot because there's so many people who are tuning in every day from all over the world, um, uh, already seeing on the comments, people from Israel and Sweden and Brazil. And, and, you know, it's, it's very cool to see you guys here. Thank you so much for that. Um, anyway, it, it's, we, we just do a lot of stuff and we do it because I, it started out that when I took art lessons, I, I, I was a mess. I was an emotional wreck. I was scared to death. I was, I, uh, my wife bought me my first art lesson because I was frustrated trying it. Uh, it was a really bad experience. Long story I won't get into right now. And I, you know, I kind of hemmed and hawed in and out. I quit several times and, and, and finally one person got to me and he really made me sit up and take notice. And he really helped me through it because I was like, I can't do this. I don't have any talent. I can't even draw a stick figure in. And he's like, yeah, you can, you can do this. Let me show you how it's processed. And if you learn this, you follow my guidance. And that's why I created my paint by note system, because I want to help other people really figure out how they can do it. And, and anybody can do this. You know, maybe none of us are going to be at the level of a Thomas W. Schaller, but you know, maybe we will, you never know. So uh, anyway, we have all kinds of things that we do for artists. And the, and the goal for me is, you know, somebody said the other day, uh, and, and it was, I was a little bit flattered by it. It was kind of funny, but they said, you know, like you're Walt Disney and you've created Disneyland for artists. Well, I don't know about that, but, but we have so many different things that we do. And I've got a, a little slide here just to show you, and you can find all the stuff we do. We do magazines, we do four or five newsletters, we do conventions for artists, retreats for artists, international trips for artists. Uh, we have books, we have videos, we have uh, art marketing, uh, we have podcasts, a couple of podcasts, we have products. You know, there's just a lot, and there's a lot more coming. We even have a, a TV channel that's on Apple, Roku, and, uh, and Amazon Fire. And so uh, you can go to streamlinepublishing.com and you can find it all, and you should. I mentioned in the beginning of this that we are going to be doing an event called Watercolor Live. We have, uh, we have not yet announced the faculty. As of today, if you go to the Watercolor Live website, which is watercolorlive.com, you will not see the faculty, but you will this coming week. We're going to announce some of the faculty, and the first one we've announced is Thomas Schaller, and so that's pretty exciting. Uh, so you can go there. In the meantime, that's in January, by the way. In the meantime, we have an event, uh, which is a virtual art conference, and this is not watercolor. I must tell you that we don't really have any watercolor in this. It's mostly oil paint. That's why we created a watercolor event separately, because we couldn't do 
easily multiple stages. And so at our live events, we do multiple stages. So we have watercolor at our live events. But Realism Live is talking about painting and, re and drawing in realistic form, right? So if you can tell what it is, you know, it's not abstract painting. There may be abstract elements to the paintings, but we have some of the top people in the world who are teaching uh, portraits and figures and still life, landscapes, plein air, floral, other things. And that's called Realism Live. We have an incredible lineup of people, some of which you've met on this show already, but we have Graydon Parrish, uh, Joshua Larock. Let me turn this, uh, turn this banner off here so you can see these names. Oh, there we go. Okay. Joshua Larock, Rose Franson. And these are legends. These are absolute legends. Daniel Sprick, uh, Juliet Aristides, learning drawing from Juliet Aristides is one of the most amazing things you can do. Uh, Daniel Gerhardt's is going to be teaching. Victoria Herrera, the great Daniel Graves from the Florence Academy. Jeff Legg. Kathy Odom will be doing landscape painting and Kathy Anderson will be doing floral painting. Connor Walton from Ireland. William A. Schneider. Uh, Tony Sirenai. Mark D'Alessio, who you met yesterday on the show. Uh, Jean Stern is going to be doing some art history. Stefan Bauman, Cornelia Herons, uh, Todd Casey, and Jesus Emmanuel Villarreal. And there's more to be announced, but that's Realism Live. And uh, you can go to realismlive.com. And if you sign up before the 30th, you will save a couple hundred bucks. And so you can use that for art supplies or go to dinner or something, you know? So uh, anyway, we do this at about a tenth of the cost of a live event. By the time you pay for going to a live event, your hotel, your airplane, and everything else, you could easily spend two, three hundred dollars or two, three thousand dollars. And so you can get into this event for a very reasonable amount of money. Um, also want to mention to you that this uh, current issue of Fine Art Connoisseur is out, and we would like to give you, actually give you this particular issue. And you can get it. Uh, you might want to screenshot this because it's a weird URL, but uh, you get this. It's a digital copy. This particular issue is the largest, fattest issue we've ever done. It is uh, distributed to 500,000 people. Yes, a half a million people. And the way that happened, we normally don't have that big a distribution, but because of COVID and we couldn't get it into the newsstands, we started working with others to distribute it to their organizations. And we've ended up now distributing it to a half million people. We'd like to give you a copy. You just get a free copy. And of course, if you like it, we hope you'll get a subscription. Uh, but this is a digital copy and you go to this uh, URL that's listed on, on your screen. Now, uh, a couple other announcements. Uh, the winner of uh, my book, my book is called Make More Money Selling Your Art. And my goal with this book is to teach you marketing. Now, I grew up in marketing. And I, I was in the radio industry and no better place to learn radio uh, marketing than in radio. And then building my own companies over the years, I had to learn this. And so I got really good at it. And, and the things that I teach are not the things that everybody else is teach because I, I'm using practical proven ideas. And I have now coached literally thousands of artists, taught thousands of artists and helped artists become people who are living their dreams. And this is really a good starting point. So the winner of the book is Natasha DeRay from Albuquerque, New Mexico. So thumbs up and congratulations in the comments to Natasha. Uh, and, and we'll be sending your book to you soon. So congratulations. Uh, today, uh, we're going to be giving away a, a digital subscription to Planet Air Magazine, a one-year subscription, digital uh, you should know that in our digital editions, we have um, we have 20% more content than we have in the print. And that's because we, of course, have extra space because digital, we don't have to pay for extra print. So Plein Air Magazine Digital is has always got extra content. And it is, Plein Air is the number one selling art magazine in America. If you've not seen it, this is what it looks like. And you can win it by making comments in the comments section. We just grab uh, we grab a, um, a you know comment at random, and they're the winner. So this is uh, showing the print and the digital, and uh, this is uh, one of the most current issues. But uh, this happens to have a, a big story on acrylic painting as well. But uh, anyway, you can get Plein Air Magazine as your own for your own home at pleinairmagazine.com, of course. 
Okay, so the next thing that I need to tell you about is uh, that um, we do a podcast every week called the Plan Air Podcast. I'm the host, and you can find it on on the Apple Store, iTunes, you know, wherever you get your podcast, Spotify, et cetera. And we've had um, many millions downloaded now, so it's reaching people in, I think, 150 different countries we've had listening, and so that's pretty cool. Another thing that's cool is we have, a, and probably will be cool, it won't be warm probably, but we're painting in the White Mountains in New Hampshire, a painter's retreats, the only live event we're able to do this year, and we are still doing it. And if for some reason it has to be canceled, then you'll get your money back if you need it, or we'll just put you into the next event. But Paul Color Week is a retreat where we paint color. This year we're painting where the Hudson River School painters painted in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. It's coming up October 12th through 19. I was supposed to be up there today, but I had to postpone because my wife forgot that her mother was visiting. And so we were probably going to go next weekend. And that's when I'll build the map of all the painting locations that we're going to, we're going to go to. Also should mention, <clears throat> we have the plein air convention. And yes, at the plein air convention, we even have watercolor. We have a, we have four stages, maybe five. I'm not, re I can't remember what we have in Denver, but uh, we have an oil stage and a pastel stage and watercolor stage and, and some other things. And so we will have watercolor at the plein air convention this year. Uh, and we always have uh, every year, except the first year, then we figured that out. And so plein air convention is going to be in Denver. We think it's going to be pretty big because it was already almost sold out before we had to cancel uh, the biggest we've ever done. And of course, if we're allowed to gather and if things are safe, then it's going to be the biggest ever. So that's the plein air convention. One other thing, I'm taking a group of people to Russia in uh, Labor Day next weekend, next weekend, next, you don't know, next year, uh, uh, two weeks in Russia. We're going to go see the sites and uh, visit the sites in the beautiful cities of St. Petersburg and Moscow. You got to see it while you're there. And then we're going to paint in those areas. You'll we'll actually be painting uh, a building like this, an old church like this. Uh, in uh, St. Petersburg, and we're going to be painting a lot of sites around there. We were pretty much painting every day, but then the best part is we're going into the old Russian villages where people carry their water and their chickens and cows in the streets and the old Russian dashes. So much fun to paint there. And we have uh, Nikolai Dubovik, the great Russian master, is going to be with us. And so you're going to get to know him. And it's not a workshop, but he, of course, will be working with people because he loves doing that. So uh, that's pretty much it uh, tomorrow. Sunday coffee with me. I uh, do this every week and it's coffeewitheric.com. You can get it for free and then um, subscribe. I just kind of talk about stuff and things, things that I think are important to be said. And uh, today uh, at 3 p.m. every day, now day number 171, every day at 3 p.m. we're featuring an artist and a segment from a video that we've produced. Thomas Schaller at the opening of the show was talking about this and that is that um, uh, we did a video with him and he's gonna, we're gonna play some of that video for you in the interview with him. And you're gonna get to know that a little bit today. And that's today at 3 p.m. And you can find it on uh, Facebook, YouTube, and just look up Streamline Art Video and make sure you hit the subscribe button because uh, that way it'll come to you automatically. This is the video that you're gonna see. And uh, this is the drawing. You'll see part of that and you'll see uh, this is the reference image, and of course, this is the painting, and so uh, it's fabulous. Now, we're going to get back to Thomas Schaller, and I, I should mention, uh, while we have Thomas on, Thomas has a, a new, fairly new book out. This is the cover of the book. Thomas, congratulations on that. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm very excited. You have, a, you have a copy of it right there over to the I, left, I see. I do, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's big. It's Beautiful. a big sort of, you can make a coffee table out of this book or you can put it <laughs> on your coffee table. Yeah. It's well, large. congratulations. You know, that's Thank what happens you. when you become world famous. People want to do books and videos. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. I, I fought for this book for about five years to get it made. Well, congratulations. The so reason I'm, is, I'm uh, in the interest yeah. of, of your time. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and let you get started. Looks like you've done a pr preliminary sketch. Uh, you did. were an architectural uh, illustrator in the early parts of your career. Tell us about that. 
I was. Uh, I was telling Eric earlier, um, I grew up in rural Ohio on a farm. My dream, because looking through uh, all these phenomenal art books my grandmother gave me, my dream was to grow up, move to New York City, and become an artist. So, well, getting to New York City is one thing. Uh, paying rent and electric bills, and, and <laughs> that's quite another. Um, I did have a degree in architecture, so I, I did go ahead. I got my registration, full-fledged registered architect, but sadly, it just never took. Uh, I was much more interested in the imagery of architecture and drawing and painting in general. So I sort of thought I would try to devise a career uh, bringing back some of the beautiful old watercolor traditions of the Beaux-Arts and of the past, uh, but applying them to more modernist architecture. And I did a bunch of sample images, walked the streets, not that way, but uh, with my portfolio, <laughs> it actually worked. I got uh, a lot of work over the years and uh, had a very nice life, very nice career doing architectural uh, watercolors for developers, other architects uh, for many, many years. Um, but ultimately there was one thing missing, which was I was uh, drawing, I was painting their visions, not my own. So, yeah. so eventually it was time to uh, turn the gears and, uh, and uh, start to become the artist that I always thought I was meant to be. Cool. But yes, so that's my background. So since we can't see you, we can only hear you, we can see the image in front of you, but uh, yeah. tell me a little bit about the composition, because I see you've got some interesting lines going across. Well, Where's obviously, be, I, I've tried never to turn my back on my architectural background, but I, I haven't. I don't just paint buildings, as those of you who know my work know. I do figure work, landscapes, all kinds of things. But I think what I'm saying, to be brief, the one thing that sticks out from my training as an architect is the power of design. Uh, the book deals with it a lot. The last DVD I did with Eric is all about the power of design. So when you're doing a painting, you're not designing a building, you're designing hopefully an emotional experience. So you have that element as a building block to work with as well. Um, I generally, not always, but I generally do a little setup sketch of the subject I want to do. This is a reference photo of the little cabin. I uh, probably can't see much, it's black and white. I have a color version, which is worse, I think. I don't really recommend painting from photographs. They're good to have as reference, of course, but for me, it's one reality uh, and it's a springboard to the ultimate reality, which is your painting. So even if I'm painting plein air or from a photograph, I try to look at it, ask myself, where's the art? Where's the painting in here? How can I take what I'm looking at? What inspired me to get off my ass in the first place and do a painting? And that's when I turn to my sketchbook. Then I start trying to analyze intellectually, where's the art? And then I try to uh, ask myself emotionally, where's the artistic experience and what I'm looking at? Generally, it's light. The um, collisions of dark and light and midtone, and secondarily, or even further down on the list, it's a collision of colors, warms and cools. Um, but my design process is all about contrast, the horizontal versus the vertical, the dark versus the light, as I say, the warm versus the cool. Um, a little quick sketch like this helps me, I guess, get the intellectual part, the thinking part out of the way so that when I go to my painting, I can just turn that off and paint from a much more calm, relaxed, uh, emotional place once I know, once I have sort of a, a game plan. I'm curious, you have, it looks like you have circles on there. I can't tell if they have numbers in them or not. I but. do. It's very geeky, very nerdy, but I do this for myself, uh, but also for demos. I number the values. I try oh. to break all, all my paintings down. I mean, there's a whole range of values in any good painting, obviously. Many bad paintings too, which I've done. But I hope they're 
because you can't forget you're painting on a flat two-dimensional sheet of paper or a canvas, all you have is height and width. So anything you can do to emphasize or enhance a sense of dimensionality and three dimensions perspective is to the good. All the nerdy mathematical lines of perspective are one way, but for me, the layering of values from the lightest light to the darkest dark is the best way. The lightest light in watercolor, because we don't use white paint typically, is the saved white of the paper or the paper showing through the layers below. Right. So I number one, which is uh, my lightest light. This will be saved white paper altogether, a bit here, a bit here, 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 and probably up here. And then you'll notice you're setting up a diagonal. Uh, Primar the primary horizontal as a composition is the horizon line, which is about a third of the way up in a sort of traditional way. There's a primary vertical, but then in my composition of values, I set up diagonals, lights, which bring the eye through this way. And then three, my darkest darks, are organized primarily. Oh, that's interesting. I've never, never really understood that. And what I hope this does, the rest then is number two's midtone values. But what I hope this does is sets up a kind of energy uh, a pleasant sort of tension within the final painting that'll bring the viewer's eye into the painting, deep inside the painting, and make uh, you travel around the painting. So it's not so much an image of something, rather it's a painting about something. About you know, you've got, you, you've got people who are watching from all over the world and, and all over America, and uh, you, you know, when we were all in elementary high school, I, I mean, elementary arts, art classes, or, or we were learning photography or whatever, they, you know, the one thing that they always told us is put everything in the center. And you obviously are using thirds. Uh, and could you kind of talk about that? Because uh, I, I, I think a lot of people miss that in composition. Well, I mean, there's no one right way to paint, obviously, or to do much of anything else. But traditionally in uh, painting composition, it's not a great idea to split your canvas right down the center. That said, those of you who know my work know that I do that all the time. If you're gonna do it, it has to be on purpose. What I've tried to set up here is a more comfortable sort of classical rule of thirds composition, which is based on the golden mean. It's just a more comfortable way to look at something. So the painting is basically landscape or horizontally formatted. It's weighted toward the bottom third of the painting from the horizon line down. And then the secondary vertical is weighted to the uh, right side of the painting with the heavier uh, elements here. This just gives a very comfortable place for the eye to rest. Generally speaking, where the darkest dark meets the lightest light, that's gonna form the center of interest or the focal point of your painting. That's where the eye is gonna automatically go. That doesn't, in my opinion, have to be one spot. It can be an area and what I was talking about before is you can set up a series of these um, contrasts to sort of pull the eye through the painting and take your viewers on a little journey through the painting and give them a little experience. I love That's, that. So uh, yeah, I, I try, it depends on the painting or what I'm trying to do, but you, the artist, you can orchestrate the experience of the viewer to a degree rather than just making a static image, a depiction of something, you can give them a, an experience of that place. Hopefully you can share a little bit about what you felt when you were standing there uh, looking at this and you can impart that in a nonverbal way to your viewers. At least that's what I'm always trying to do in my paintings, to okay. paint an experience, not to just paint, um, an image of something. We have cameras for that sort of thing. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah, 
I try cool. not well, to. Yeah. Thank you for that. You know, we've got about uh, 25 minutes left. And so I want to let you get to your painting. But oh. I did want to ask you that because I think it's an important. Yeah, I, for me, it's, it is the fundamental thing. It's the reason why I'm painting this. Um, I mean, painting is painting. It's fun. I love it. But it's, it's good, I think, to have a general overall plan before you start. In watercolor, oil too, any other medium, your plan is likely to change or shift or even go out the window as you're painting. But it's good to have a general idea. Um, one thing in watercolor, you start- Looks like you have a little triangular thing under your canvas, under your I board. I have a little, well, I've, I've tilted my big drawing table up to try to get everything in camera. Usually okay. I, I have it at a much steeper angle, but I, I put a little wedge I had made underneath my board right. because in watercolor, uh, gravity is one of the materials besides paint and pigment and brushes you can use that's still free. They haven't managed to charge us for gravity yet. <laughs> Somebody's asking what kind of paper you're using and what kind of paint. Perfectly great question. Um, the paper I'm using is a Chinese paper. It's called a Bao Hong, B-A-O-H-O-N-G. I tried it out a year or so ago in uh, Shanghai. I loved it so much that um, I now have some of this paper in my name that's being produced by Senior Art in uh, Australia. And it's just starting to be distributed in the US. It's 100% cotton. It's very, very textured. I love very, very textured paint uh, paper. Paints I'm using are almost exclusively by Daniel Smith. I do have a few Holbein pigments, but generally Daniel Smith are for me. Uh, very much like Streamline, they're a great company that uh, they understand art and artists, and they work with art artists to make uh, very expressive, better paints that work for all of us. So are you making an, an underpainting here, or what are you doing? I'm painting the, generally speaking, I paint the lightest parts of the painting first. The parts of the painting I'm gonna save as pure white. Obviously, I don't paint at all, so that's the lightest light. I start in with the lightest mid-tones. This is the sky, which is behind everything. I'm painting it in a very washed out, warm color. Right. Red, reddish. I'm doing it upside down so that I can help maintain this light line around, around uh, the building, which much of it I wanna save as unpainted white paper. So if you use gravity to your advantage and let it run downhill, you have a much less risk of it running back and covering up something that you want to maintain as white. Makes I perfect don't, sense. I don't use any masking fluid or, or tape, not because I'm against it, but because I'm just too lazy to do it, I guess. <laughs> also, it's a skill, which I don't possess. There are artists who are so good at it, but I am not among them. Once that sets in, you can flip the painting back around. Also, uh, people might wonder why I did this in a warm reddish tone. I'm sort of trying to establish a, a late in the day view uh, feeling. That's when I most saw this cabin was uh, later in the day after shooting my video all day. And it was just such a beautiful, calm feeling that that's, that's literally what I'm trying to paint. The feeling the I had- The cozy cabin, isn't it? It's really great. I could, I was worried you were gonna have to have me evicted, but, but uh, I left on my own accord eventually. Well, one thing that's nice about it is the logs are, you know, they're full trees. And so it's so quiet in there. It's like going into a womb. It really is. It's uh, just beautiful. I and mean, it's surrounded, like you say, with all these beautiful, uh, li I think they're live oak trees. Yeah, just they're live oak. Amazing, beautiful trees. 
I, I would go to Austin or the area in Texas just to see the live oak trees. They're just like nowhere else on earth. They're amazing. But anyway, so the reddish tone is to help establish an overall tone for the painting and a mood, a bit of the narrative, but also to complement the greens and uh, the cooler tones that I'm gonna use for the grass and the uh, trees around. I always paint in complementaries. So red versus green, blue versus orange, yellow versus violet, etc. And you can see that I'm just painting areas, not things so much. That's entirely on purpose. You can see that the paper has such character. You can, uh, if you paint fairly wet as I do, the brush, these big flat brushes especially, skip right over bits of the paper. And it's not a bad thing, it's a good thing. It helps enhance the luminosity and transparency of the, of the final work, I hope. Mary in Wisconsin is asking what kind of brushes you're using. Oh, uh, gosh, I love brushes, as we all do. I can't go into an art supply store without an adult because I want to buy everything. But to answer your question, I generally use a combination of rounds. These are all synthetic by Escoda Perla series. Beautiful, great quality brushes that hold great uh, lines and details. When I'm starting and I want something very wet, I'll either use a mop, either a Skoda Aquario series are great. I'm getting used to these new brushes that, um, that I'm loving by Neef, N-E-E-F, Masters Mops. They're fantastic. What can I say the name again? Uh, it's a master's mop, but the company is Australian N E E F. Okay. And these guys are making me my own line of brushes soon. So I have to ah, plug that. Oh yeah. I guess uh, you better use them. <laughs> yeah. God, God bless them. I kind of gotten, uh, addicted to these, uh, hockey or hawk hake brushes. I got in China. These are all squirrel, natural hair. They hold a lot of water. Um, they perform much like um, a regular mop, except that uh, they come in various widths and can cover large huh. areas of paint. A little more useful for much bigger paintings, but they're yeah. still, they're great. I love going to art supply stores in foreign countries, always finding oh. things that we don't have here. Me too. I'm, I'm, I'm the worst though. I have to be escorted out by the authorities because I want everything. Shanghai has some of the best art supply stores. My gosh. But that said, I, I got lost. My friends lost me last year and I think I was in Rome and I vanished into an art supply store for three hours. But um, this is another kind of brush uh, made by a lot of companies. This I got in Rome, but Da Vinci makes these. They're a type of liner brush. has a, yeah. big, bar a big barrel and a long um, liner element. I use these often for trees because they make very organic looking scruffy trees without having to work too hard at it. Uh, these I'm putting in in the mid ground to the background against the wash that's still reasonably wet because watercolor is often so much about edges. It's another way to imply perspective in your work. Um, washed out colors, especially in the blue or cool tones, tend to look farther away and imply distance. A softer or so-called lost edge tends to make something look like it's further away than a very dark or hard, crisp edge. Just kind of common sense, but something 
I don't think but, we think about often enough. No, you're right. We don't think about it enough. Um, I do teach perspective, and usually my groups, when they even hear the word perspective, their collective shoulders start to hunch, and they they get very nervous. But you know that might need to be your next video because I think there needs to be a perspective video. I think there should be. I want to do one actually on drawing and perspective, and not just the mathematical type, but the types of perspective I'm talking about. The perspective for the artist yeah. about edges, about uh, different types of colors and hues. Well, one thing people don't typically think about is that perspective impacts when you're putting figures in, in a big way as well. Absolutely. So you're you're very, good at, very good at that. But I think the main thing I would want to get across in, in my teaching of perspective is that Whatever else it may be, it's just common sense. Things that are farther away from us tend to look smaller than things that are closer. Yeah. And you're things about, that are... You're about 15 minutes out, so I just wanted to give you a fair warning. Okay. Um, largely, the house is going to be saved white, but not entirely, of course. So what I want to do is what I've got established is the background, a little bit of the foreground, in the mid-tones so now i want and the lightest tones are already painted for you by the white of the paper so now what i want to start to do is put in some of the darker tones and then even if i don't get it a hundred percent finished you'll see where i'm going with this well what you can do is post the finished painting uh yeah. in in the comments section for everybody to see later yeah oh yeah good idea i will do so yes if it's not a hundred percent done i will post it and then you guys can tear me apart and ask me anything you need to. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you tend to try and keep your, your darks cooler or do you do warms and cools in your darks? Um, I've been criticized and rightly so because I do a lot of very warm tones in my shadows. I think because watercolor is what I call a subtractive medium, meaning the light is really unpainted. Yeah. So what we do as watercolorists is we subtract away by painting the shadows and the shades, the ultimate light available to us. So for that reason, you don't paint the light I get asked a lot, how do you paint light in watercolor? And the answer is, you know. smart, my smart ass answer is you don't, it's all painted for you. Yeah. So given that, because I think that's largely true, I think you have to think a lot about the, uh, the liveliness of your shades and shadows. So I do a lot of complimentary warm tones and cool tones, but dominantly warm tones often in my shadows to give them life and um, more luminosity than just dull gray. And also, I don't know what it is, but I, I look at shadows and shades wherever I go in the country and in cities all over the world. I'm always amazed by how much like light and warmth and color exists inside the shadows yeah and it probably you got you kind of you got to train your eye to get it though because you don't see it in the beginning you don't you just see dark and uh, i think people some people tend to just look at dark and assume gray dark or dark, black, yeah. black but uh obviously a warm tone can be very dark as well well and there's a lot of reflected light in shadows yeah, especially, uh, well, especially noticeable in places like Spain or Italy, where the sun is so bright. But it's no less true anywhere else. It's just not as obvious, perhaps. But yeah, shadows are where it's at, at least in watercolor, because that's where the light goes to uh, gain strength. Somebody's asking if you ever do uh, watercolor paintings without doing a sketch on the paper first? 
I do, but uh, yeah, I do. But however, I think drawing and painting are so integral, so connected. Um, and I also just love to draw. I teach a lot and often people will say to me, oh, I love to paint, but I hate to draw. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I, I hear you, but I don't quite understand you because drawing with a pencil, of course, is uh, expressing something with a line. Whereas drawing with painting is expressing something with a, with a shape, a shape of light or dark, warm or cool. But to me, it's all, it's all drawing. It's all connected. So. You know, I, I think what, what people are saying in that is that um, in some cases, painting, they believe, hides their inability to draw. Um, well, and, I, it, and I'm not trying to be just, you know, uh, unkind to anybody, but I think the, I was kind of that guy is that I, you know, I couldn't sit down and do a beautiful drawing like that one that you've done but I would do a painting and I would justify, well, this is a little impressionistic and it might be, it's interpretive and it might be okay that the drawing is off. And sometimes I couldn't even see my drawing was off, but I, I think that that's kind of what, what they might be thinking or saying in that case. I, yeah. Everybody has to learn how to draw. That's really paramount. Well, I do agree with you. I think a lot of people are afraid of drawing, but I think unnecessarily because you don't have to be a world-class draftsman to be, to be able to sketch or draw reasonably well. I think now, when you people, draw something like that with such clean lines, are you doing that freehand or using a straight edge? Um, I don't, I try not to use straight edges too much, but I should also back up and say, I did this a little bit darker than I normally would and also a little more complete because I wanted it to show up on camera. Uh -huh. When I'm just drawing for myself, I will, I would definitely not draw everything you see here. Right. More indicators. Um, just indicators, sort of stop and start points, that sort of thing. Uh, actually, I should say, much as I love to draw, it is a mistake for me. I think I can say for others often, if you draw too much on your final paper, it tends to make you paint a little slower, a little more tight than you normally would. Yeah. It's better often to draw less than draw more. So just to be clear, I don't think you should or have to draw every little line of your, of your sketch before you start painting it can uh, it can really throw you off was there a turning point for you when you when you were kind of going through the the learning process of course you did this in school and architecture school and so on but once you started doing a fine art career was there something that ultimately made a big difference and helped you take a leap forward well yeah um I mean, I don't want to get too heavy, but I think all of us are our worst critics. We're all so afraid of the judgment of other people and ultimately, I think, of ourselves. I wanted to be what I would call a real artist for years, afraid I wasn't good enough, so I never entered any uh, shows, um, you know, on and on and on, endless stories. Everybody can find an excuse not to do something that they want to do for fear that they won't be good at it. Yeah. But um, I was a big fan and still am of my, my friend and early mentor, Joseph Zabukvik. Joseph is to... also going to be in Watercolor Live, by the way. Yeah. Yes. Great. Well, he's an amazing guy. I love him. We've become friends. He's a great, I was, great man. I, when I started out, though, I was horrified. I was an architect, um, but I painted on my own by myself, hidden away in my room, much like today. <laughs> <laughs> Things haven't changed that much. <laughs> but uh, I, I read somewhere uh, Joseph was coming to the U.S. to give a class, and I mustered up my gumption to go. 
I didn't want to paint like him. I still don't. I want to paint like me and nobody else. But I wanted to see, I guess, I just wanted to meet him. But I also wanted to see how does an artist live? How does a real artist approach the world? And that's why I wanted to meet Joseph. So I went. We were sitting around after class one night. And he said to me, you're a decent painter. High compliment I came to learn. He said, so what do you do? I told him. And he said, well, you don't sound too happy about it. I huh. said, well, I really want to be um, a fine artist. I want to paint full time. And he says, well, why don't you? And I gave him the usual excuses about rent payment and life, health insurance and, you know, the usual excuses. And he turned to me and said, I don't know you very well, but shut up. I said, what? He said, shut up. He says, if you want to paint, just paint. All the rest of it will work itself out. Boy, he's so right. And I have to admit, at the time, I thought, oh, my God, what an, how arrogant. But then over the time, that phrase has become more and more true. And yeah. he meant it. He meant it absolutely, but he meant it with uh, with respect and sincerity. We got about um, three or four minutes left here. Okay. Sorry to rush. No, that's okay. I'm getting the main elements laid in. I think you can see even at this stage the lightest lights I've saved. The midtones were the second to be painted in, and now the darkest darks. The darkest darks don't all have to be the same intensity. They don't all have to be black, obviously. I consider this part of the darkest dark. This in the foreground, midground, background, modulate your values to set up depth. But anyway, Joseph uh, really meant it. He really meant it with love, actually. And uh, I took it to heart, and my whole life changed that day. I started to design, design my life. I talk a lot about design of paintings, but really it's all in uh, the design of your life. It's what so do you, true. What do you choose to leave in and what do you choose to leave out? We all have to take a stand. We all have to decide every single day how we're going to spend that day, how we're going to spend that time. And he literally changed my life. And so I determined that very day that I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I was going to become an artist. And That's a great story. I, you know, we and, tend to go through life like a pinball machine. You know, the pin, we just go to one thing and it bounces to, to another thing and so on. And, yeah, and, and, I, and we don't realize that we actually can design our life, that, we, we, that we're, we're in charge. That's so true. And I think I knew it intellectually, but I didn't feel it. And he's the guy that made me feel it and uh, realize that I had agency over my own time, over my own life and how I spent my days. And it was entirely up to me how I wanted to do it and the responsibility that comes along with that. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it didn't happen overnight, but I uh, entered a uh, AWS that very year, I was too terrified to enter. And uh, I did get in. I haven't gotten in. I haven't gotten in big shows every year. I've got my share of rejection letters. But you know what? That doesn't matter. Once you get rejected, it's actually sort of a good thing. You get that out of your system and you realize it's not the end of the world. And uh, nobody can judge Nobody can judge you harder than you judge yourself. So absolutely, it's all fine. So I am going to work in some deeper shadows here on the ground as also part of this uh, system of darkest darks. When this dries a bit, I'll put a little more dark there. So you'll get the diagonal darks reading through and then the diagonal of lights reading through this way. That's fascinating to me. I, I, I don't, I don't think I ever understood that or seen anybody do that before. And uh, I'm going painting 
I'm going to go painting today. It's a Saturday. I get the rest of the day off. So oh, I am, uh, I'm going to try it. Uh, I recommend trying it. It's, it's fun. I mean, you can overdo it like everything else, but it sets up uh, a kind of subtle energy and dynamics inside the painting that might not ordinarily be there. Why are you doing diagonals? Sir? These? Yeah. Um, I'm just connecting. Paintings for me are all about connecting. I didn't want these dark shadowy stripes to take too much attention. So I was just connecting, taking away some of these skip marks by connecting uh -huh. one, one tone to another. Okay. Another way to do it is with this handy dandy little mist gun, which I am addicted to. Uh, these guys are great. They can emphasize or uh, help you blend tones one to the other. They can also wash pigment right off the page. So yeah, you a little goes a long way. All right. So I'm going to make you stop now because we're, we're out of time. But um, Well, those are the basics. You have any, any final thoughts? You got like maybe a minute for final thoughts. Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. There's a, a secondarily important truth massive trees here won't be as dark as this i want this to be sort of backlit in the foreground these will be dark too not as standalone trees but to help emphasize this shape of dark that i'm trying to create in the lower right, right. it'll balance out the dark in the upper left awesome. so that will happen i'll put a tiny bit more detail on the actual cabin but i think what you can see is large parts of the identity of the cabin are uh, completely unpainted altogether. They're just the weight of the paper. So all I've done is painted uh, loosely the shades and the shadows that give, um, that give the light its life and its identity. Awesome. Well, Thomas, thank you so much. Uh, this has been fascinating and, and I'm honored that you would be on our daily. Are you great. kidding? It's great. I, yeah. I'm and thrilled. It's cool. I just, and it's cool that you painted the world famous artist cabin. <laughs> it's such a great place, but uh, yeah, I've been wanting to paint it for uh, many months. So I was glad to have a chance to have right. a swing at it. Thank you so much. Well, I'm, I'm going to say goodbye now and, and uh, applause everyone and thumbs up and hearts. We love it. Thank you, Thomas Schaller. Thank you, Eric, and thanks everybody who's watching. Uh, hang in there, everybody. We'll get through this. Yes, we will. Well, speaking of getting through it, uh, first off, that was Thomas Schaller. What an honor to have him on the show today. Uh, just a couple of final thoughts. Uh, for those of you who are watercolorists watching, we are going to be launching the world's first virtual watercolor conference worldwide. People from all over the world are invited to attend, and uh, we don't have much detail on it yet. Uh, we will have announcements. Thomas Schaller is one of the announcements, and Joseph Bookvich is one of the other announcements. Uh, but we're going to have the world's best watercolor artists on Watercolor Live. It's going to be five days, a beginner day, and then four other days. And it's going to be in January, after Christmas, late later January. So you could go to Watercolor Live and get your name in there so you can get notified when we get the information out there. But that's coming up. But uh, the big one uh, coming up also, if you're an oil painter or you want to learn figure or a flower or still life or various forms of things is Realism Live. And that is uh, coming up in October, uh, October 21 through 24. And uh, if you get in before the end of the month, you're going to save 200 bucks. World-class artists. Go to realismlive.com to find out who they are. I want to thank you guys for watching. It's 171 days in a row. Hard to believe. Remember today at 3 p.m., Thomas Schaller is going to be doing a video, and that's at Facebook or YouTube. Just search Streamline Art Video. I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher of Fine Art Connoisseur and Plen Air Magazine. Happy Saturday, everybody. I'm going to go painting. Yay. I get the rest of the day off. And thank